Hi, everybody. Um, thank you all for coming to our webinar today. Um, my name is Brooke Carey. I am the lead storyteller at Gravity Payments. And prior to coming to Gravity, I spent 10 years in the book publishing industry. So this topic is very near and dear to my heart. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Gravity, uh, you might have heard of us a few years ago um, when our CEO, Dan Price, announced that he was cutting his $1 million salary down to $70,000 and starting a $70,000 minimum wage at the company. Um, so we got quite a bit of uh, notoriety and attention for that. But at our core, we are in the business of helping other small businesses. So we are a merchant services and payments processing and technology company based out of Seattle, Washington, that works primarily with small and mid-sized businesses to save money and hassle when it comes to accepting payments both in store and online. Um, so we are putting on this series of webinars in order to offer some perspective and hopefully advice and concrete information to uh, small business owners in our community and those who have never heard of us before, um, especially during this time since we know that small businesses are really hurting right now and trying to figure out just how to get through this crisis intact. So we wanted to focus today on independent bookstores. Um, indie bookstores are very close to us as people we work with, but also just huge pillars, <clears throat> excuse me, in members of our community. We work with several of them um, as clients, um, but we're also just big fans of them, generally speaking, as consumers and readers. Uh, so today, we're excited to be joined by Lexi Beach. She is the owner of the Astoria Bookshop in Queens, New York, and it also happens to be my neighborhood bookstore. So I'm very excited to have her here. We're also joined by Christy McDonald, owner of Secret Garden Books in Seattle. Uh, Secret Garden is one of Gravity's merchants and also right around the corner from our offices in the Ballard neighborhood. So we're there quite a bit. Uh, and then we're also joined by Sarah High, the partnership, Partnerships Manager for Bookshop.org, a very new online bookseller, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. So thanks to all three of you for being here. We're very excited to hear from them. Um, just a quick note before we begin, um, after we have our panel discussion, which should take around 30 minutes, we'll be accepting questions from all of you. So if you have a question, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom panel and draft it there and send it to us. And we'll get to all of those um, in the latter half of this webinar. Feel free to add a question anytime if you think of anything, but we'll be saving them until the Q&A portion of the talk. Uh, so to begin, I'd love to start by hearing from Sarah. Uh, Sarah, I know that bookshop.org launched right before this crisis began as a way to kind of challenge the dominance of Amazon when it comes to the e-commerce in the book world. Um, so I'd love to hear from you about how you all have been able to respond to demand during this crisis and some of the challenges you've been seeing, uh, how you've been working with bookstores and also some of the trends you've been seeing since you started. Awesome, absolutely. So we launched on January 28th. Um, and we're still currently in beta, which means that we still have a lot of, you know, small things that we're repairing and things that our web team is constantly working on improving. Um, we should be out of beta probably in June or July. Um, so very, very soon. But um, we, of course, did not plan for this very strange, horrible pandemic to happen during our, our first few months at Bookshop. But we have noticed that um, very, Luckily, we were able to help a lot of stores um, earn revenue during this really difficult time while so many of them were were closed. Um, so I'm really happy that I, I could be a part of helping, you know, bookstores. I'm a former bookseller myself that I was at Book Culture in Manhattan. So always, always love talking with booksellers and helping, especially at this very difficult time. Um, so yeah, we've noticed that, of course, you know, sales have been very high they have dropped you know just kind of slowed a little because so many stores are opening back up which is fantastic we want people to get back into their bookstores um so right now we're kind of seeing a transition back into bookstores but back in uh you know february really march uh and um april it was we were experiencing very high sales and it was it was really great because most of our 
um, sales go to bookstores directly. So that's really wonderful to see. And we we saw trends in books like um, a lot of purchases for Ling Ma's Severance and you know pandemic esque books. Um, but also on the other side of that kind of more self help. How do I get through this? Um, you know, so kind of a mixed bag. But I think some very helpful, but also um, you know exciting reads to kind of distract yourself with during these times. So that's kind of what we've seen so far. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Um, Christy, I'd love to hear from you a little bit. So I know that your shop and you obviously are in Seattle, which was kind of the um, first place, first major metropolitan area where we started seeing cases of the crisis in the United States, cases of the virus in the United States. So I'd love to hear from you, I guess, about just kind of your experience um, going through this time, um, how you transition the shop and kind of where you are right now, as I know, Washington and Seattle are, are starting very in the early processes of reopening. Okay. Well, I wish that I could say that we operated with a plan, um, but since things changed daily, um, in including me having a little bout of symptoms that looked suspicious early on, um, turned out to be allergies. Um, I tested negative at that time, I know, yeah. So, um, you know, not being able to be in the store while I w waited to find out. Um, anyway, so th there were just so many, um, it was just so uncertain. Um, when our governor did finally give the shutdown order, I believe it was the 23rd or 4th of March, um, the staff had been maintaining. We, we were so busy before we closed because everybody was um, packing up, you know, loading up, not quite knowing what was gonna happen. Um, and they were exhausted and wanted actually to be furloughed. Um, and it was pretty unclear, um, that even with a shutdown order, what we were allowed to do and what we weren't allowed to do. Um, it still can be, and we have a great governor. I'm not complaining. It's just a bit, I'm sure he's figuring things out as he goes too. Um, so for the rest of March and all through April and a good part of May, um, the model was that I mostly single-handed the store along with a person working from home, doing direct to home from Ingram. We're pulling almost no inventory out of the store um, and everything was just direct to home out of Ingram pretty much. Um, and then I had one very, very part-time person at the store who helped me deal with things that came in over the email and we didn't even answer the phone actually. Um, <laughs> Cause that was a rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> uh, and that's how we got through it. I, I focused an 80% I would say of my energies during that time, not well, I did actually on returns um, because even with the dating that publishers gave us those looming bills for May now do, we just can't have a book on the shelf that someone isn't, isn't, isn't asking for. Um, that discovery thing is just gone and will be gone for quite some time. I suspect, you know, the beautiful book you bring in that someone's going to see and be enchanted by and that sort of thing. We just can't afford that inventory. Um, we also do a pretty fair number of school book fairs and that just came to a screeching halt. In fact, one was packed and loaded in my van ready to be delivered and the next one was in, ready to be loaded in, in the back room. So that all, all had to get taken apart as well. Um, so returns and just trying to figure out how to keep that kind of core aspect of the business physically there. You know, the, the best thing I did during, besides returns, realizing we were closed, I read about Barnes and Noble when they closed all of their stores and they were remodeling their stores. So I did a couple of things. Uh, I wish we were at the store, I'd show you, that would have we would have had to have closed to have taken care of, like refinishing our wood floors. So now we have beautiful, refreshed wood floors. Um, anyway, that tip came from Barnes and Noble. <laughs> Thank you, James Daunt. Um, Anyway, so uh, yeah, that's kind of how we got through. And then when um, we were permitted to do curbside again, I called back the furloughed staff, three of whom have come back. And our state has a share work program where they can continue to get 
part unemployment whilst I bring back part of their hours. I don't know if every state has that, but that has, that was really helpful in terms of getting, um, having people being willing to come back to work, but also doing it at a, a clip that, well, afford isn't the right word, <laughs> that was manageable. So that's kind of the path. Um, yeah. And Lexi, kind of same question for you. You're obviously in New York City, so um, we've uh, had our share of struggles <laughs> as, a, as a city. Um, so I'd love to continue to question. Yeah, <laughs> um, for you about kind of how you adapted and kind of also where you are now and kind of what you're looking to do, you know, at least in the in the near future, because obviously everything's changing. Yeah, uh, yeah, everything seems to continue to change day to day and week to week. Um, we, uh, I have a very small team um, and some of them live walking distance from the store and some of them don't. And we are, as, as New Yorkers, most of us, well, none of us on my team have cars. And so once it became evident that taking public transportation to get to work was a hazard that limited who could actually come in. And so I sh shifted responsibilities um, to those staff who couldn't make it in to monitor email and do customer communication that way and to write some blog posts for us and to cover social media so that the those of us who could more safely get into the store while we were in March still in somewhat operational mode um, could focus completely on receiving and getting mail orders out and handing books off at the door. Um, and that last week in the middle of March before uh, New York's pause order was put into place, we were at like full holiday level busy. Um, the numbers that we were seeing uh, were comparable to a busy December week which is our busiest month of the year always. And it was, it, it helped a lot to put us into a position where we had a bit more of a cushion um, in the bank account going into what was obviously going to be a very quiet period. Um, because for six weeks or so, basically nobody set foot in the store. Um, I went in once wearing homemade PPE to get myself there so that I could set up a remote desktop access. Um, my one employee who lives really right around the corner from the store uh, went in to get some paperwork that I only had a physical signed copy of to submit for our um, PPP loan. Um, and other than that, we, we continued to communicate with customers via email. And when they would place orders, we would ask them like, okay, we can't get this to you right now. Do you, do you want it? Um, do you want us to hold the order or do you want to wait until we can get it for you, which we don't know when that's going to be. Um, and we encouraged people to order gift cards and um, uh, to pre-order things that come out later in the year. So we've got tons of orders now for, um, uh, Susanna Clark's book that comes out in September, Paranese. Uh, and it's, it's changed, I think it's changed the game for us, at least temporarily, on pre-orders because we've been focusing so much on that that it's really interesting to see what people are pre-ordering that wasn't necessarily something I thought was going to be a high-profile book. Um, uh, but the number of customers who were like, yes, that's like, we're fine waiting on this. We don't need this book right now. Um, or who very happily, we canceled their order and we sent them a link to the same book on bookshop.org because they, um, that was a really, really helpful thing for us as a small team uh, to have as another, um, another outlet, another storefront. To direct people to because our customers are incredibly loyal and they really wanted to support us as best they could. The number of emails and Twitter messages that we got saying, what is the, how can I buy something from you right now that benefits you the most? And that kind of thoughtfulness in 
consumer behavior, I don't think you see in too many other kinds of retail. And we're so grateful to our customers for that. Um, so uh, we are now, just for the past few weeks, we have resumed doing curbside pickup, but with just one employee at the store at the time, because that's the current, as, as we understand it, as it's been explained to us, which the communication from the government has been spotty. Um, so we're pretty sure that this is, this is above board to have one employee in the store at a time doing work that cannot be done from home, which includes, um, doing contactless curbside pickup that is by appointment only. Uh, and so that has been a whole new learning curve for us and for our customers to figure out how to manage that. Um, and then starting to mail things out again, which we have a big backlog and that is a time consuming labor uh, process to, to pack up books and to get them labeled and then wait for the mail truck to come by to hand them off. Um, uh, and then now, just last week, we started receiving new inventory. Um, when we first started offering curbside pickup again, I was really just focusing on inventory that we had on hand. Um, our POS and website are through a company called Book Manager that syncs almost simultaneously your inventory with your web listings. And so you can go to our website and filter for what's in store and see whether we have it on hand or not. And that has been like, I don't know how we would have done the last several months if we didn't have that system in place. Um, because even then from home, I can check what we have on the shelves. And like, granted inventory is always like maybe 95% accurate, but um, it's better than nothing. Uh, and um, we've now started doing a feature where I'm asking each of my staff once a week to find something that our website says is in stock that isn't on the first page of browsing results, meaning that it's not like the thing that our website is putting in front of people's faces anyway. Some backlist title, some newer release that's maybe under the radar. Um, and make a staff recommendation for here is a thing that you can order on our website to pick up right now or tomorrow when you're able to make an appointment. Um, and so to feature our, our inventory that way. Um, oh, uh oh, it looks like Lexi froze. Um, Unfortunately, um, hopefully we'll get her back in just a minute. But while we're waiting for her to come back, um, I did have a question because I know Christy, you talked about returns, handling returns early on in the process. And then um, Lexi was also talking about receiving new inventory. Like so Christy. I'm... Oh, yes, Hi, Lexi, you're back. Had I frozen? Okay, yes. Yes, you were frozen, <laughs> <what> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so fin uh, we, you cut out like a, I don't know, 20 seconds ago. So yeah, if you wanna okay. finish your thought. Yeah, I was just saying how what Christy was saying about how that that browsable discovery is sort of absent right now because we can't invite people into the store and the, the physical space of the store that you can walk around in that many of us have designed to encourage people to walk around in and find something isn't an option right now and probably isn't going to be an option for many weeks and months to come, but not at the same level. And so just figuring out new ways to feature those books we love that you might not find otherwise. Thanks, Lexi. I'm actually gonna change the question I was gonna ask because you brought up another one <laughs> just now um, that I wanna ask. So you kind of answered it a little bit. Um, so I'll, I'll turn to Christy and then also Sarah, if you have anything. Um, I'd love to hear about how you are, you know, trying to market your current inventory um, to, consumers right now since the you know bookshop experience is currently not available to them or have you tried anything new like what Lexi was saying is trying to bring up stuff on the website or are there other creative things that you're doing um, to kind of push what you have in stock you know right now I'm not sure we have the bandwidth to do more than what we're doing we're a couple days behind we've had an indie commerce website for uh, 20 plus years 
And we've never had, it's never been a huge um, source of orders for us. It got better in 2018 and it got better again in 2019. And this is just like, um, it's all we can do to keep up with it um, because every, every order has, you know, one, two, three, four books on it. Two of them are in the store, two need to be sourced. They need to be put together. The customer needs to be notified. Do they want curbside? Do they want us to mail it out? And yes, mailing, we, we joke that we, you know, when, when um, someone said something about not being a shipping clerk, <laughs> um, wasn't what booksellers signed up for either, you know, um, but we've done a lot of it. Um, but, and also in my current staff configuration, we don't really have um, quite enough tech ability to get things rapidly onto the website and prettily and nicely. Um, the, indie, the indie commerce website is better every year, better every time they tweak it. Um, and it's been worth having all these years. I have no complaints. It's just, um, we just don't happen to have that on staff right now, currently. Um, so I've actually cautioned my staff not to have too many ideas unless they can actually execute them. Um, we're probably doing best. Uh, one of my staff is a brilliant merchandiser and she just is, is laying arrays of cards or puzzles or books or whatever, taking a photograph and we, we're Instagramming that. And that has been reasonably effective. Um, but that's kind of where we're at technologically. <laughs> um, and like I said, when you're two, three days behind on web orders, it feels like that's probably what you should be focusing on, you know, getting the books to people who've already asked for them. Um, we'll have to revisit marketing later. And in the meantime, blessings on all the people that have wanted to support us, as you said, Lexi, during all of this. Um, gift cards bought way ahead of time. Um, yeah, yeah. We're actually also trying, um, Three of our book fairs have, have done various models of, of virtual book fairs. Um, I do not see a future in that, at least not for the Secret Garden. I know it's working for some other stores, but um, you know, one of the advantages of book fairs is we, we buy the inventory separately at different costs and it, the, the give back to the school is kind of built into that model. And when they just order online, that margin just isn't there. Um, <laughs> So, but the schools are hurting too. So I'm, I'm happy to figure something out to help libraries get a little bit of a budget. Um, so uh, that was more answers than you asked, but. <laughs> that's, uh, that's all right. I was gonna actually ask about the, the book fairs anyway. So you kind of already answered a future question. Um, Sarah, do you have anything else to add? Obviously I know you're not brick and mortar, so you're in a different position, but in terms of um, you know, kind of how you're marketing your services, obviously also as a brand new service, kind of how you're getting the word out um, and uh, how you're attracting consumers and um, deciding what to promote on your site. Yeah, definitely. Um, a lot of, you know, similar things to what Christy and Lexi have said, you know, puzzles, um, kind of stay at home things that people can distract themselves with. Um, featuring a lot of great bookseller lists on our homepage that include those sort of sideline things um, in addition to books. Um, and yeah, um, mostly just kind of filling in the gaps of what can we help people, you know, think about buying with their local bookstore in mind um, to help them through this very strange time. So. Um, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned puzzles because I was going to ask about <laughs> about puzzles. I know that there's been like a run on them. Um, we have a nice stock at home, but we haven't been able to do them because our two-year-old would never allow it. Um, so uh, one of my questions that I started to ask a little earlier um, was about inventory. So Christy, I know you talked about how in the beginning you were focused on returns and kind of sending back some of your inventory since there was really no way to push it. Um, and Lexi, you were talking about how you're kind of starting to receive uh, new books right now. And so I just wanted to um, talk to you about kind of how you're, how you're going about managing inventory at this time. And as you look into ordering new books, um, like what exactly has changed for you um, when you're looking at kind of publishers upcoming lists? Um, what are you doing differently than you might have 
if this we weren't in a pandemic. Oh, Christy, you're muted. Um, we have not opened up, we have not resubmitted our front list orders and we, we halted everything. Um, pretty the last on sale date we got was April 14th. Um, and we are starting to see orders for some of that now. And that's informing how we're reforming <laughs> um, our front list orders, well, spring orders and then going forward. Um, I'm sh I think they'll need to be half or less than what we would have ordered otherwise. We were having a pretty good year, um, even without the panic buying that occurred in March that Lexi also described. Um, and uh, so, and going back and remaking your orders on Edelweiss is, is labor intensive. It is work folks can do at home, although they, we don't have a feed from Wordstock to, um, we don't have what, what we have in the store, we don't have that on Edelweiss and we don't have above the tree line on Edelweiss for bunches of reasons that, um, remember we're not so techie. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, right now, I've, the only orders I've placed are um, teacher orders that make sense to get from their publishers. Um, our state awards have been just listed, so I've gotten those stocked that way, but we haven't opened up very much front list at all. Um, and have vowed not to think about fall till July. Lexi, is there anything you want to add to that conversation? Um, I've been gradually, I had a bunch of fall appointments scheduled for this month and um, uh, have gradually been realizing that I just need to cancel all my front list orders with everybody and redo them across the board, probably like one month at a time. And so that's, it's easy enough to tell my sales rep, please cancel everything you have back ordered for me but then the way that our system works i have to go in and mark things as canceled within our point of sale so that i'm not confused and think that like okay we get a special order for this book that just came out this week that i was supposed to be getting five copies of but didn't because i canceled that order and so do i have it on order or not and the the like putting together all those little pieces takes a lot of time and I can log into our point of sale remotely from my home but only in those hours when I don't have a bookseller at the store and so five days a week for four to six hours a day I'm locked out of that um, and so I'm doing that in sort of odd hours and Thankfully, when I do cancel all of these orders, Edelweiss keeps the record of what I had ordered and I can go back and see um, what it was that I was planning on getting. Um, but for right now, um, uh, I'm mostly going with what customers have special ordered and um, ordering as much as possible, even more than I do normally direct from publishers because most publishers are offering generous terms right now. And I know I'm, we're not supposed to talk in any kind of specifics among ourselves, but um, if, if you didn't know that yet, fellow bookstore owners, most publishers are offering very generous terms right now, whether it's bonus points or extended dating or, um, or any number of other kind of options. And so I've decided to prioritize margin over speed and, um, getting things from Ingram wholesale is my last resort right now. Um, especially since so many publishers seem, from what I'm hearing, I'm still like just getting started with the reordering, but I think a lot of publishers are routing their bookstore orders through Ingram anyway. But so you get the publisher terms, but Ingram does the fulfillment. And so checking who has it in stock doesn't even make any sense. Um, so my next step is figuring out what the timelines are for these orders that I'm placing so that I can start managing customer expectations a little better in terms of this is when we expect to have this thing for you that you have either said you can come pick up at the store or that 
gradually as we get through the long queue of the backlog to ship out, we will ship out to you. Um, it is, it's good to be busy and it's good to have, as Christy said, several days of a backlog of web orders to be working through because it means that we still have customers who are giving us money and um, want to make sure that we're still gonna be here on the other side of whatever, whatever the other side of this looks like. Um, but it is, it is a lot of labor and it is labor that's sort of changing week to week because uh, reminding my staff how to receive things and knowing when I can only help remotely and there's only one person there to do it. And so they've got five boxes that came in, 70% of which are special orders and they're also looking at the door um, for managing those pickups and um, just making sure that things get allocated correctly to the order that somebody had placed and not be like extra copies of Rodham that I ordered in because I knew that more people were going to be asking for it. Um, and it's just a lot, it's just a lot to keep in my head all at once, um, especially when I can't be there in person because I don't have a safe way to get to my store. Um, so I'm managing remotely and that that's the hardest thing for me is that I know how much physical work there is to do right now. And um, my, it, like, it's not safe for me to go on the subway right now. Um, it's about an hour and 20 minute walk uh, to get across the East River from where I live to where my store is. And I'm, I've done it, I haven't done the walk, but I'm debating at what point it will make sense for me to do that a couple times a month, um, given the fact that my wife is immunocompromised. And so any risk that I put myself at is putting her at risk. And so like how much, how much can I expect my staff to keep doing just the three of them who can get to the store um, without any physical help from me uh, while I am gradually ordering in more and more books that need to be received that I can place the orders for, but can't do the receiving or the packing or, and it's, yeah, I'm rambling now, but it's, it's a lot. Yeah, that but sounds like I can totally empathize because that's how I felt the, those days that I was waiting to see if I was sick. It was just awful. And um, it, I know it, it added to my stress and my staff stress. So it's hard. It's hard not to be able to be there. Yeah, I've, I've never owned and operated my own business, but I can't imagine when you own something and you're used to being there every day with your staff, how hard it must be to just not be in the physical space and not be able to be there for your staff and just kind of in the, the space that you're so used to being. So I, I really can't imagine. Um, and I really thank you all for sharing that perspective. I'm sure, you know, the people on this call, the other owners on this call can, can relate. Um, so I do, I do want to um, turn it over to Q&A in just a minute, but before I do that, I just wanted to kind of ask um, one, well, final question from me, I guess, which is, um, what do you think uh, the future holds for your store, or in Sarah's case, the, the website, um, and for the indie bookstore landscape in general? I mean, I know that um, indies for the past, well, for a long time now, um, have there's always kind of talk about them dying but then come making a comeback and um, they seem to be very resilient but obviously that this is a very unprecedented time so I'm interested to hear about from your um, I'm interested to hear from you directly um, what you are seeing and, and kind of what you're looking toward uh, as things quote unquote go back to normal you can go first since I'm sort of the outlier um, I think for bookshops part, we want to make sure that we are there for the stores in whatever way they need us to be there. Um, you know, as you all know, we're a new company. We're still in beta, as I said, so we're still adding new features and adding new things to the site constantly and fixing and, you know, improving it, you know, on a weekly basis. And so anytime a store 
you know, has an idea about how they would like Bookshop to look in the future, what, what things a bookstore would like on their Bookshop page, we always want to hear that because um, I really believe Bookshop is a great extra tool to have in your back pocket when you are a busy bookstore owner or a busy bookseller and you can't do all this work by yourself. It's really great to have an extra, you know, kind of tool to point your customers to when you can't do everything, especially at this crazy time. So um, always want to be here for you all and always want to hear what you need from us and really, really appreciate you sharing um, everything during this really crazy time. So whenever you want to reach out, I'm here. Well, I'll go next. Um, if past is prologue, um, and yes, it is an unprecedented event, this one, um, but if past is prologue, I think the, I think organizations like our American Booksellers Association and our regionals, and in my community, our, we, we, our little Ballard Alliance, um, realizing that independent businesses have more in common, um, figuring out ways to pull together and make that um, a strength and being really um, telling that story to the community, I think helps a lot. Um, we live, you know, we're, we're in the land of the company I call Voldemort. And we saw, we did see a perk of orders from people that couldn't get a book from Voldemort. And in a few cases, I think we probably persuaded them that we could do a really very, very good job. And in a few cases, they were shocked that they didn't have the book that same day. Um, it's, it's, it's just an education process and this will be a continuation of that. But I'm so, as I said, looking backwards, m many of us wouldn't be here if it weren't for the ABA. Um, going back to the Penguin lawsuit that helped establish what used to be called Book Sense, um, helping, helping me have a website when getting one on my own was so expensive, um, help, helping us have eBooks on our website when that was an important thing, helping us have audio books more recently, um, downloadable audio. And I, I tell you, you know, the, the day after we closed, I got a personal phone call from Allison. I was blown away, um, just the feeling of support. So. That's my, that's how. <laughs> I will admit that there have been days in the past few months where I've let myself think, well, what if, what if I don't have a store in six months? What if we fail? What, um, uh, cause I, I don't know. Um, Things are still so uncertain in terms of the retail landscape. Uh, my landlord is not giving me any kind of break on rent, um, even though my I, I've lost revenue that I will never regain. Um, and so what, um, and I don't know how quickly, even once we're allowed to let customers and feel safe letting customers come back into the store, there's just no way to predict how quickly our revenue is going to rise again. Um, and for right now, what I'm seeing is that it takes so many more hours of labor to get the same or less really uh, in terms of sales. Um, I've kept my entire staff on the whole time because um, I, at first it was because I just couldn't fathom doing anything else. And I, and I, I needed the help in um, managing customer communication. Um, I couldn't, I was a one woman operation for the first year that my store was open seven years ago. And I can't, I, there's no way I could go back to doing that. I just, I, it's too much for me um, and admitted that like, okay, the jobs that you had before don't exist anymore. If you are willing to be a customer service representative on email, if you're willing to be a social media manager instead of an events manager, like then, okay, we, then, then that's your job now. Congratulations. <laughs> um, and uh, we've, we've kept it, 
we've kept it going, um, but it does require so many more people and hours just to get the, okay, the order is placed, the payment, the order is placed from the customer, the payment is taken, the order is placed with the publisher, the customer is notified, the pickup is scheduled, the pickup happens, or like there's just so many more steps that are involved. Um, and I, I don't know what the sustainability of that is long term, um, given the margins on books. Um, we're making it work for now. Uh, I had a, enough of a cushion in my bank account that I could go into this and I sort of, I kept it on a like one pay period at a time saying to my staff, okay, I can promise that like, you're gonna be on payroll until at least this date. And then, and then, and hopefully I will have an update for you before that date comes around. And then we did get our PPP funding. And so I could say, okay, we're like, we're, we're good. And now we have a lot more revenue coming in. Um, and so it's all just really like day to day and week to week and I can't, begin to predict as far out as the fall. Um, I, I think once we're able to let customers in the store again, and once I need more, once I can have and also need more than one person in the store at a time, um, my staff are going to have to make some decisions for themselves about what jobs they're happy to have because sitting in front of a computer answering emails all day is not being a bookseller. And if that's what you want to do, and if like if there, there if there's a reason you don't work in an office, <laughs> uh, then like that's probably not what you want to do long term. And so everybody's we're we're gonna have to figure out what is really feasible for everybody. Um, certainly, what I'm doing right now, which is just like processing on web orders, taking payments, and um, communicating with my credit reps and uh, applying for grants. Like that's not, that's not what I signed up for. <laughs> um, but it's, it is a shifting landscape and I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll figure it out, but I think it's gonna look very different. And I just, I'm, I'm not good at the long-term projections. Um, and like, I've never had, I've never had a five-year plan. When I signed the, for the lease 10, no, seven, seven years ago, seven years ago this month, I signed the lease on my storefront and it was a five-year lease. And that was the first time that I had a plan that went out five years into the future. Um, and that, that is as far out as I can think. So I don't know, I don't know, we'll see. Cautiously optimistic. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that at least. Um, yeah, I, I, it's hard to make any sort of decisions, let alone a five-year plan when the rules for how you can actually operate your business change um, daily and also aren't usually explained very clearly. Um, I did want to actually, I, I wanted to ask a follow-up question, um, Lexi, because I know you mentioned applying for the PPP loan and um, I don't know, I imagine that some of the people um, in this conversation have looked into that or have applied, perhaps some of them were lucky enough to receive it. Um, we've heard from a lot of the business owners that we work with and they're, you know, in a bunch of different industries um, that, uh, you know, some, pe some of them actually have like some he hesitation about applying for a PPP loan because um, one, they're not sure of the guidelines seem to keep shifting or we're kind of vague. We ourselves had applied for one and weren't really sure what we could use the money on for a while. Um, but also because the payback terms for businesses with, you know, low margins um, are, are pretty aggressive. I think it's like a two year payback, um, payback term if you don't spend the money exactly how it's aligned in the time that's aligned. So can you talk a little bit about kind of your decision and your experience with that and, and kind of any of the um, concerns that you had or kind of how you're, you're approaching that process? And Christy, I don't know if you applied at all, but if you have anything to add, obviously feel free to weigh in as well. Um, yeah, I uh, sat on a lot of webinars that the Queens Chamber of Commerce and the New York City Small Business Solutions had offered about various funding options that were open. And um, I did apply for the PPP loan and 
got it in the second round um, once the the bill once the funding was was replenished by Congress. Um, my for me, it's it definitely made sense. My team is very small. My payroll, well, it it is my second biggest expense every month. It's not really that high. So like the amount of money that I got is like we didn't get a million dollars. We didn't get half a million. Dollars. Like no, we're we're just. I don't pay myself very much. And <laughs> uh, so it's, and my bank did me the favor of s establishing a second checking account for this money specifically so that the record keeping will be very easy to show what it was used to pay for. Um, the ABA has spelled out very clearly like, okay, here are the forms that you need to show that this is how you've spent the money. Um, it, uh, it, I think I don't anticipate having to repay any of it. Um, I'm, I need one of the things I need to do this week is like sit down and make sure that my check what my payroll was for these two months last year compared to these two months this year because my staff has changed a little bit um, and I've been underpaying myself for the past couple months just to give the business a little bit of a cushion. Um, uh, but I don't. I don't anticipate having to repay any of it. Um, I've now gotten just yesterday or the day before gotten an offer for the EIDL loan, um, which is a different matter. And that is a much larger dollar amount that they're offering with a much longer payback term. Um, and I'm debating if I'm de that is a, is a longer question for me. Um, the PPP loan was sort of a no-brainer because it, my my like socialist business owner perspective is that since our government can't be bothered to give citizens a paycheck every month to keep them able to pay their own bills while this is going on and it's not safe for many people to go out and do their regular jobs, that's what the PPP funding is for. I can just pass it off to my staff and say that like, okay, this this is your government check right now and and we'll deal with it later. Um, uh, that's that's my perspective on that. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, we I actually applied three times. And <laughs> I was turned down once and then one I declined because the other one finally came through the third one finally came through not very much money no and um, because my staff did want to be furloughed um, they they just were so exhausted that's what they chose they chose um, I'm gonna have a hard time meeting the 75 percent part you know in terms of but I'm also actually not unhappy to keep the rest as a loan um, I'm not afraid of debt and I'm not afraid of a red bottom line for a while, you know, if I can kind of see my way through. I, I've done five-year plans. I've been that kind of person in the past. And right now I don't, I don't even know where to start on it, but it's in the bank account. I love your idea of a separate bank account. We'll do that. We'll do that this week. That's a very good idea. Um, and I'm just going to kind of wait. I'm, I'm hoping, that some of the payback terms will start to modify a little bit as Congress um, realizes what a what a challenge it's going to be for people to really use the money. Um, but we'll see. <laughs> we did apply for an idle loan earlier and got the ten thousand dollars dropped into our account with no notification, no nothing. It just showed up, <laughs> and we may apply for a, a larger one and then pay and give back the PPP. I think that might be better for us, but I haven't thought that through. Um, you know, it's, it's just not enough. <laughs> it's just not enough. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so I um, just want to add before um, we get to some of the other questions on this feed, I just wanted to add a couple of comments. Um, one from Noelle, she said, not a question, but I just want to give a huge thank you to Bookshop. They've been our lifeline through this. So shout out to Bookshop, a little love for you guys there. 
Um, and then um, Juliana asked, um, she said, this is so helpful. Thank you. Our customers love to visit our store because of the experience of being there. We also sell crystals and spiritual sidelines. So we are having great difficulty selling online curbside pickup or shipping. We have tried sales and kits on social media, but sales are really low right now. Any suggestions? We, this might, um, may or may not be helpful depending on how web savvy you are and what kind of e-commerce system you have. Um, but I've set up just two pages so far on our website featuring some of our sidelines. Um, in some cases, I asked permission from our vendors because it's like sometimes you buy something where like the vendor has an Etsy store, but they also sell wholesale and normal terms are that like you can't list them online. But I like these are special circumstances. And so far, I haven't had anybody say, no, you can't. Um, so I have a tab on our website that is our like bookish accessories. Um, that is like book inspired candles and soaps and um, uh, the out of print stuff that we carry the um, socks and things um, and a local vendor who makes um, has started she's been making quilted um, bookmarks for us uh, and now has started doing cloth face masks with book print fabric um, that have been like we've sold out of them practically as soon as she brings over another batch and she lives around the corner from the store so it's easier for her to bring them in and then another tab that features um like games and family card games and puzzles and activities for kids um some educational uh activities for kids just to like put all those things in one place that are um uh the things that you need to browse for because you don't know if this is the right thing and you're not you don't know how to search for that on a website um so if you uh can it's 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 been somewhat effective for us uh i think more the adult stuff than the kids stuff but um i don't know i think getting getting to families is hard right now with young kids because they're so preoccupied with just like the day-to-day -day of kids. Um, uh, and so I think the adult sidelines have been a little bit easier of a sell for us. Um, and I'm, I keep like counting and keeping a very close eye on our Instagram following because as soon as we get to 10,000 followers, that's when we can start adding links into our stories. And that's this like weird metric that I've been obsessed with for a year and a half now. And we're like 750 people away from that. And, and then one little thing will become easier. I don't know, maybe it won't make any difference, but I'm still, it's still an exciting proposition to have like another place where I can add a link because Twitter is easy, but Instagram is not. You can show things to people. And I've found that Instagram sells things really well, but it does take the extra step of somebody then going to your website to buy the thing. If that helps, or maybe not. That's a little plug. Everybody follow each other. Um, uh, a story, at Astoria Bookshop, at Secret Garden BKS, I believe. Uh, Christy, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, and then at Bookshop underscore org. Um, and at Gravity PYMTS, even though we're not in the same, in the same boat, but we would also love that Instagram feature. Um, so thank you for that, Lexi. Um, uh, and then, um, oh, uh, Rod says, thanks everyone. This is terrific, very emotional actually. I feel less alone. I'm glad to hear that, Rod. I'm glad we could at least provide some emotional comfort during this time. Could you talk about the mechanics of curbside, any unexpected problems, et cetera? And to echo Noel, thanks so much to bookshop.org. It's been a real help. Well, we have a little, uh, little more elaborate curbside, it sounds like, than you do, Lexi. Um, we have listed hours on our website, and people can come during those hours, and I make sure the store is staffed. We are staffing at two, roughly, two, sometimes three when I'm there. Um, it's a, there's enough room to spread out, and we're not 
in close proximity. And when, when someone wants, feels like they need to wear a mask in the store, they do. Um, and we always wear a mask when we go to the door to hand a book off. We have um, the shipping table and then right in front of it, right next to the door is things that folks are gonna pick up. Um, and that, the city's providing curbside signage for restaurants. They've been doing that all along and now they're offering it for retail pickup too. We haven't gotten ours yet, but we're right next to a, a bar and they've had their um, things that mark the, the space for pickup on the curbside. So that's, I think that's helpful. It gives people a sense that at least they can park and run in. Um, back to the, the sidelines. Once we were open for curbside, once we were allowed to do that, we filled the window with um, puzzles and just people just point to them, pay over the phone and we hand it to them through the door. Uh, if you have any kind of um, ability to put your wares in the window and just have some kind of signage that says point and shoot or point and pay or something like that, um, we turn that window every week. <laughs> If we could get more puzzles, we'd turn it better. But you know, you all know about that supply chain. So, um, but really, I think what works for curbside is having a, a pretty good idea of what your local recommendations are, and talking to other neighbor businesses and about what they're doing, and trying to kind of have a community ethos standard, and making sure that your that it's it's an it's stringent enough that your staff are comfortable and matching what your customers also seem to want um yeah because i think it's not black and white anywhere does that help <laughs> yeah. uh for us for curbside pickup we are um uh, sending the link to schedule a time for your pickup once you've made a purchase or once your books arrive that you have ordered. Um, I debated like putting a big button on our website to let people just like schedule their time, but like I don't want them doing that until we know that they actually have something ready to pick up. Um, it has, so our, we started off with 15 minute windows um, to begin with because I wanted to make sure that my that it was working and that we were not having a crowd of people outside the store because I see that in my neighborhood outside bars that are doing curbside pickup and curbside essentially having like sidewalk bars and I that is a nightmare to me I I don't want to be that business owner um, uh, and it was working well enough that we shortened it to 10 minute windows um, for the most part, it's working. There are, we've had at least one customer who admitted after she picked up her books when she was like, oh, I have an appointment. And my staff was like, oh, I don't see you on the schedule, but like, okay, we, ha we have your books, okay. And then she admitted that she hadn't actually made an appointment because you have to make an account with the system we're using to make the appointments. And she just didn't want to do that. Um, and so she just showed up. And I like, you can't stop people from just showing up. You can ask them not to show up. Um, you can ask them to stick as closely as possible to their window and explain why you want them to do that because it is for their safety and for our safety and their neighbor's safety and um, to please step back from the door when we open the door to put your purchase on the table that's outside and not like, no, you can't just come into the store right now because there are definitely people who, who try to. Um, and there are people who like stand right at the door and my staff have had to tell them like, please, please back up so that I can open this and we can maintain a distance. Um, there are, there have been, I think the, any system, like we're using Schedulicity is one, um, is one that we're using. I've heard of another one called Skeda. Uh, I have a feeling that any system for scheduling that kind of appointment is not going to be perfect because not there none of us know how to use them yet um our customers don't know how to use them yet and so people are learning and some people it works very smoothly and some people forget to hit the final button that says yes book this appointment and so they think they've scheduled themselves for two o'clock and so they show up at two o'clock and we don't actually have them on the schedule anywhere so like there's there's glitches 
and we're sort of keeping an eye on how it's going and so far it's going well enough. Yeah. Let's say we have a local grocery store that I've modeled our curbside after because they have a dual appointment and then they, they limit the number, it, they're allowed to bring people into the store, but they've limited the number of people that can be in the store. And the way that they do it is either by appointment or you show up and you wait until, you know, there's a slot for you to go into the store. They've just done a beautiful job and a very um, warm and friendly job with it. So look around and see what other businesses are doing. I think you can learn a lot. And I, yeah, we're next to a bar um, and yeah, there's usually quite a few people waiting for their their piece of pie and booze. That's what that bar serves. <laughs> so, and yeah, we early on when we opened up for, well, actually, yeah, when we opened up for curbside, um, people would order the book in the morning and then come to the store to pick it up in the afternoon. And then we had to say, don't come until we tell you that it's ready. We're not, your book isn't here yet. And, um, it, hopefully it's crystal clear now on our website, but people don't read everything either. You just have to do your best. Um, and it is very helpful to make sure you're always checking in with your staff that they're comfortable with how it's going because it can slip really easily. Um, yeah. That's really good. That's a really good point, Christy. Thank you for mentioning that about checking in with your staff. And um, yeah, there definitely sounds um, like there's a, quite a bit of consumer re-education that has to happen <laughs> during this time. Um, I'm sure that as a consumer myself, I have been one of those people that is slipping. <laughs> so if I have encountered your business, I apologize. Um, I know we are at time actually a little bit past and I don't want to keep you um, much longer. You all are very busy and I really thank you for taking the time out of your day, both to our panelists and everybody who else who has joined the call. Um, and thank you for providing questions. But um, I guess I just want to ask if there's any kind of final thoughts or pieces of wisdom that you all want to share. Um, you don't have to, but I just wanted to give you the opportunity as we close up. So um, Sarah, I'll start with you and then we'll just kind of go around. Sure. Yeah. There's also a question about um, if my shop isn't partnered with Bookshop, please email me. Um, my email address is listed on the website in the about section, but it's um, Sarah with an H dot my last name, H-I-G-H at bookshop.org. I would love to talk to you and see how you can participate with us. Um, and really, really happy that I was able to join this call. Um, and my heart is going out to all of you. And please keep in touch. Let me know whenever you need me. We're always here. Christy, any uh, final Final thoughts? I've, I too have had moments like you described, Lexi, where I wondered if it was even worth fighting this battle. Um, I'm at another end of my life, and so it, get, it has to get tussled with, you know, gee, I was going to retire in 10 years, maybe not. <laughs> maybe it won't be that long. I don't know. Um, I love what I do. I love my staff. I love my customers. And in many ways, you can do, you can be a bookseller into your dotage. So <laughs> um, I am kicking and screaming to keep being able to do this. Um, I'm so glad to have found this industry and the community around it. Uh, thanks, Christy. And actually, while you were speaking, we got a comment from somebody. Brian says, tell Christy, I love what an old pro she is. And thanks for doing this. And that's a quote. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Lexi, um, over to you. Um, I'm not sure I have any final words of wisdom when you invited me onto this panel and presented it as being a panel of experts. I found myself asking, what am, what am I an expert at? Um, I have, from day one of starting my business, I not really known what I'm doing, just kind of like throw things at the wall and see if they work. And many, many things have, and I've been really lucky about that. And right now it's, it's just like starting all over, throwing things at the wall. Um, I don't think I'm an expert at anything right now, except I know, I know how to use my own POS system really well. Um, <laughs> I know how to process web orders really well right now. Uh, but in terms of like the broader picture, I don't think there are any experts right now. We've, we're all 
just making it up as we go along and watching what's happening and reacting as best we can. Um, uh, what, Brooke, what you were saying about being the consumer who's like maybe not reading all the signs, like we're all living through societal trauma right now and our brains are not fully functioning. That's just how trauma works. And so I've tried to give everybody, especially myself, the benefit of the doubt that when you screw something up, um, it's, it is not like, forgive, to forgive myself and to forgive other people. And when I see somebody at the little green market that's up the street from me that is still functioning where they've got a cart of potted plants that says, if you touch it, please buy it. Remember the safety, like keep in mind the safety of our employees. And I see somebody looking at a plant right next to that sign and then putting it back. And I'm like, dude, the sign was right in front of your face. But we're, we can only do so much right now. We, our brains can only process so much. Um, and so we're, we're all like, I'm, I am also going to keep fighting as much as I can because I, this is the best job I've ever had. Um, and I don't, I'm not ready. I'm not, I'm not giving it up. I'm just trying to like game plan. What, what if I don't have this job anymore, but right now I do. And so I'm going to keep doing it the best I can. Thank you for that, Lexi. That's, I think, a really great kind of note to end on. Um, it's, it, it, you're right. We're all figuring this out, each and every one of us, both as professionals and as just people in the world. So I think that's something really good to keep in mind. Um, so I just love to thank everybody again for, for participating and um, uh, just a quick little plug for gravity. Um, so if, since somebody brought up kind of merchandising other non-book related products. Um, if you are looking for an option, we do offer e-commerce solutions. So you can, if you're interested in exploring that, it might be, maybe not, but if you are interested in exploring that, you can get in touch with us. You can contact us at info at gravitypayments.com or you can email me directly and I'll make sure to put you in touch with the right person. It's B Carey, C A R E Y at gravitypayments.com. But I manage both of those inboxes. So whichever one you want to send it to is totally fine. We'll also be following up with um, some follow up. Uh, we'll be including the video of this recording. So if you missed any of it or if you want to share it with any other owners that you know, feel free. Um, and so we'll be following up with some other resources and you'll be able to get in touch with us that way. So I really, really appreciate it. It's been an honor for me. I am so grateful for all of our bookstores. Um, every, every, I can't wait to go back into a storybook shop, Lexi, and I can't wait to be able to travel to Seattle again and be able to go into Secret Garden. So um, I'm very much looking forward to that day. Um, and in the meantime, keep reading, keep on fighting, and we really appreciate all of the work you do as an avid reader myself. I really appreciate all the work you do. I think that our communities would be just so awful if we didn't have local bookstores. So I'm rooting for you guys. And I know a lot of other people are. So thank you all um, and be in touch. Take care. Stay safe. Bye.